Hi folks, um, it's about three minutes past 10, so I'm gonna get started. Um, Linda Fraser is our uh, is at Policy Scotland, and I am also from Pol Policy Scotland. My name's Sarah Weekly. I'm a research and impact officer there, and we are really happy to be here in partnership with the Third Sector Research Forum. And the representatives from the Third Sector Research Forum, which you'll hear from towards the end of this session, um, is Jane Marriott. Um, if you want to know more about the Third Sector Research Forum and Policy Scotland, our contact information will be on the um, final uh, on the final slide um, after I share my screen. But um, as you know, I'm just going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, and also a couple of here we go. Oh. Uh, Linda Fraser, can you um, enable sh sh screen sharing for me, please? That's you. Should be cool, so did I? All right, fantastic. Two seconds. Did I? A couple of housekeeping things, though, while, while that's getting going. Um, you should be um, all muted as you come in, just because of the number of people who are who are in here. Um, but just to quickly check that you are muted um, to, to ensure that the speakers can be heard properly, that would be great. Um, here we go. About that, let me start from the beginning. Avert your eyes so you don't see any of this information. <laughs> okay, here we are. Um, here we are. So um, welcome today. Here's all the information. You should be in the right place. Um, this is going from about 10 to 12. I'm going to do a quick run through of um, what were what the schedules looking like. This is our uh, this is the quick uh, hello. This is hello. <laughs> the first first up, we're going to have um, Andrew Patterson from the Scottish Community Development Center. The second uh, third sector um, organization we're going to hear from is Voluntary Health Scotland from Kirin Zuberi. And the third third sector organization we're going to hear from is from Inclusion Scotland. Um, again, these you'll see from the timings that these are very short presentations. So the aim of these presentations is to um, start a conversation that will continue into the breakout sessions. So as you go through, if you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat function. All of the chat function, uh, all of the chats will be archived, so they won't be made public. But if you have questions for particular presenters, I can forward. They can either see those or I can forward those on as we go. Um, and if you have uh, just a general question for for the rest of the group, you can also feel free. To, to put that in the chat function and um, and those will be archived. Um, given the timings, I'm not quite sure how much time we'll have um, to address those questions right now, but um, it, we can certainly follow up. So what I'm going to do now is stop talking and uh, send it over to Andrew Patterson. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yes, uh, I'm the priorities that I'm going to bring up today are based on the research that Scottish Community De Development Centre has done with community organisations around Scotland responding to COVID-19 supporting people in their communities. Uh, we spoke to, in a couple of bits of research, we spoke to over, well, we surveyed over 200 community organisations and spoke to around 30 with telephone interviews. Um, so can I have the next slide, Sarah, please? And uh, 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 the, uh, if it, this is the, probably a learning point for me, but um, yeah, Sarah, you might have to just sort of go, go through this and uh, pressing uh, each one and I'll talk about it as it goes. 
So you can see the combined factors there that community organisations have been telling us that obviously COVID-19, the lockdown and social distancing and the economic downturn are all impacting on communities and their organisations too. And the types of impact include the ones that have just come up there, the things that you'll have heard of and you'll, um, from uh, various uh, sources, unemployment is um, obviously a big issue. Financial hardship and poverty are being reported as increasing. Mental, he mental health is a huge issue for people. Physical health too, either as a direct result of the virus or from being, not being able to um, take part in exercise. Other issues such as domestic abuse and addiction are being reported by community organisations too. So they're reflecting a lot of the things that we're hearing through all sorts of different research and the media. On the positive side, community spirit is there. Um, community organisations are reporting that just as much as uh, you'll have heard from elsewhere. The emergency community-led response has been magnificent. It, it has undoubtedly saved lives. And the community organisations that we've spoken to have appreciated the rapid funding that was put in place immediately from the Scottish Government and from independent funders. The creative solutions that they've been coming up with, we've been hearing all about those. And in terms of partnership, uh, we, we hear a sort of mixed picture. There's been great partnership between community organisations. Sometimes it's a condition of funding that they are working together. Uh, sometimes there's great examples of working with uh, commercial organisations in lending vans, providing food, all sorts of things. Um, and partnership between the public sector and community organisations is a bit of a mixed picture and it's one that we don't have a clear picture of. So we want to say too much because we want to know more about that. Sometimes we've heard that there's a new, stronger partnership as a result of COVID-19, but there's also a lot of issues where we haven't uh, heard much in terms of where partnership has been good. Uh, so we'd like to know more on that. The impact on the community organisations themselves, um, well, a wider and deeper demand on their services. Uh, more, more people, that, so wider refers to the fact that there's more people being affected by the issues that community organisations tend to deal with. Then there's also a deeper demand in terms of the most vulnerable groups being affected the most. And that the, the, the issue is that these, um, this demand is having to be met at a time when there's challenges to providing services to do with social distancing, to do with social anxiety and fear of COVID, um, which means that the most vulnerable groups are um, likely not to be so confident about using services in the first place. So uh, that's, that's going to be an issue. Sustainability is obviously a big one. Fundraising has been difficult during the, uh, the lockdown and uh, groups are worried, community groups, community organisations, the wider voluntary sector will be worried that uh, the funding that has been put in place immediately means that there might not be so much further down the line for ongoing services and for core services. Uh, and there's been a, uh, on the positive side, the community organisations are benefiting from an increase in volunteers. And obviously the question is whether that will last into the, the recovery period as well and, and, on, and ongoing. And there's also this increased risk recognition and trust that they're experiencing as well, which has been a real um, benefit for them. So our policy recommendations are continued funding and support for community-led responses. To put it simply, these issues that we're talking about aren't going to go away anytime soon. We need to put community organisations at the heart of the recovery. So we've been talking about how uh, community organisations have been responding to COVID-19, but now they need to be part of the recovery. They can be part of the recovery in, ter in terms of um, let, uh, re the reach and trust they have with the most vulnerable groups. And the most vulnerable groups' voices need to be heard if we're going to have the right sort of recovery that tackles inequality and other social injustice. Uh, and uh, also, the, we, we don't think that you can overstate the benefit of participation and community-led approaches, community organisations are all about participation. We need a bottom-up recovery that in, it involves everyone and that's going to build the resilience that we want to see in place. But we need to support every community to be as resilient as well because community organisations that, that, that have uh, had the best responses locally um, aren't, aren't uh, in place everywhere in Scotland. We need to support that sort of activity everywhere. 
And lastly, we need to support better local partnership. Where it's been strong, we need to um, build on that. And where it's been lacking, we need to know why and learn from other areas. It also just taps into this final point about not expecting the community or sector to do everything because that's, uh, that's not what we want. We, they're not this sort of panacea to all our issues. We need to support them and we need to work in partnership with them. So that's me, thanks. Thank you, Andrew, for that whistle-stop tour. Um, moving quickly on to Kieran. Thank you. Um, so again, good morning. I'm Karen Zaberry, the Policy and Engagement Officer at Voluntary Health Scotland. So we are the national intermediary network for voluntary health organisations across Scotland. And our role is to act as a conduit between policymakers and the Scottish Government and the newly formed Public Health Scotland and our member and wider voluntary and community sector organisations. If I could get the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So during the very first week of lockdown, we decided to respond to a number of requests from Scottish Government, Public Health Scotland, and also third sector organisations for information regarding the impact COVID-19 was having on the health and well-being of people, as well as organisations' own ability to continue to provide support. We agreed to conduct a survey of our member organisations and the wider third sector that would give us a baseline of key issues which we could use to sense check the situation as the pandemic progressed. And since then, we've been holding a range of thematic Zoom meetings to explore how these issues have developed. So I'll run through some of our key findings. Firstly, inequalities are central to how COVID-19 has affected our population. Well, it's been said that the impacts of COVID-19 are felt across society, that the virus disregards social class, gender, ethnicity. It's clear that this misses a crucial point of how the virus impacts the most vulnerable in our society. COVID-19 has not only highlighted the pre-existing inequalities within our society, but it's also caused them to become further entrenched. Since the initial stages of lockdown, many people have been experiencing a loss of income due to self-isolation, job losses, business closures. People have been noting a difficulty in accessing the benefit system. There's been an increase in food and fuel poverty, homelessness as people are unable to keep up rent or mortgage payments. We've also heard of people on low incomes or gig economy workers who couldn't choose to stay at home if their employer won't furlough them, meaning that they've had to earn a living by compromising their health. What we're seeing is that while many of these issues existed before COVID-19, they're now becoming more widespread. We've also been seeing a decline in people's mental health and well-being, resulting from the initial social distancing, uh, distancing measures and the uncertainty that has continued even through the easing of these measures. There's been an increase in fear and anxiety in those with existing mental health conditions, but also increasing poor mental health for people who are normally emotionally resilient. The social distancing and isolation measures have made loneliness and social isolation more widespread and those who are already marginalised we are now seeing are worse off. The loss in social contact has exacerbated people's poor mental health and those with strong social capital have been left feeling uh, isolated and this has been worse for those who already lack social connections as they're often further from accessing both formal and informal forms of support. This is only made worse by issues such as digital exclusion. The Scottish Government's 5 million fund Connecting Scotland is a welcome step to support some vulnerable groups to get online, but we're already hearing of difficult decisions being made at local level about who, is, who the support is given to um, and sort of differences between different vulnerable groups. We're also hearing about an increase in alcohol, tobacco and drugs use as a coping mechanism during the lockdown. And a number of organisations um, have also told us about an increase in people reporting suicidal thoughts. And this has just gotten worse as the, as the pandemic has progressed. We've also come to realise that this has all been happening in the backdrop of a face-to-face -face uh, of, uh, of a decrease in face-to-face -face services. And as NHS staff have been redeployed to help with COVID-19, we've seen a fall in what is deemed as non-essential health care. This is adding to the stress and anxiety of those with existing conditions, those self-managing conditions, and those who have already who've been recently diagnosed with a range of conditions. 
all of which has had long-term implications on people's general health and well-being, but also on the demand and so, uh, for services and support as we come out of lockdown. Now, the voluntary health sector and the wider civil society have been very well placed to help and rapidly adapt to reconfigure and extend their services. We've seen an enormous amount of creativity, um, adaptability and swift action on the part of the voluntary sector in dealing with the crisis. Many organisations have adapted and extended their services and are now providing a suite of online, telephone and face-to-face -face services uh, dealing with not only the symptomatic issues created by COVID-19, but also providing holistic support to tackle the underlying inequalities as the pandemic progresses. However, there is a need for this to be sustainable and for this community level mo uh, momentum to be maintained post COVID-19. This needs to be supported by appropriate national and local government policy and actions that are informed by those that are affected. Sorry, can we go to the next slide? I keep forgetting about the slides. That's okay, yep, we're on to, yep. Final slide. We know that the gap in life expectancy bet uh, between those from higher and lower um, income households has widened over the last decade. And this has been increasingly linked to the post-financial crisis austerity measures. The social and economic impact of COVID-19 could be much worse. It's therefore imperative that all future policies, strategies, legislation are centred around protecting the health, well-being and inclusivity of those who are most vulnerable in our society. What is becoming increasingly apparent is that the implications of COVID-19 on people's health and well-being will transcend the duration of this pandemic. It's imperative that, this, that there's continued assistance and services available to communities and especially to those who are most vulnerable in order to provide people with a buffer from the long term consequences of COVID-19. To end on a positive note, what we're seeing is that the conversation is moving towards building back society to be better, more inclusive and equal. As a society, we're seeing more open and visible debate on issues such as universal basic income, the importance of well-being as a measure of national success, and co-designed and inclusive policy development. Even during the pandemic, we're seeing a growing civil society with increased volunteering and active engagement at a grassroots level to support, um, to support those who have been the most vulnerable. It's important that these conversations and ideas are given a space and momentum to change the course of our inequalities trajectory, both during and post COVID-19. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kieran. Our next presenter is Rebecca McGregor from Inclusion Scotland. Hi there. Um, so as uh, Sarah says, my name is Rebecca. I'm the Policy and Research Officer at Inclusion Scotland. Um, we are a disabled people's organisation. Um, so we're a national inter intermediary organisation led by disabled people. And I'm going to talk a wee bit about a survey which we ran through April to find out what impact the crisis was having on disabled people. So in the survey, we asked a range of um, questions on a range of issues, including thing, uh, questions on social care support, access um, to food and medicine, social security benefits, employment, um, experiences of isolation, amongst others. We got over 800 responses to our survey, so it was, it was really quite a big task to analyse the results. Um, and we wanted to get them out quite quickly so that we could start to use the findings. So if we could just go on to, to the next slides, please. Thanks. Sure. Um, so some of the findings from our survey were quite stark. I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Um, just due to the, to the short amount of time that we have. So in terms of social care support, 30% of respondents told us that their social care support had either been stopped or reduced. And people were left in quite desperate situations as a, as a result of this. And um, people told us about being forced to sleep in their wheelchair or being left unable to get out of bed or to feed themselves. Um, other people told us they were unable to wash or dress themselves or keep up with basic household chores. Um, over half of the respondents um, also told us that they had experiences, experienced difficulties accessing foods for themselves or for those um, that they care for. And over a quarter of respondents uh, reported difficulties getting the medicines that they need 
uh, needs to maintain their health. And some people even told us that although they were shielding, um, they had no other choice but to leave their homes um, to go and get these essential items. Um, in relation to health, disabled people told us that they lost existing health services and supports for both their physical and mental health. And although we didn't ask um, a direct question about this, 7% uh, of respondents told us that their medical appointments um, or routine health services have been cancelled or reduced um, since the start of the crisis. And that was obviously causing a lot of worry um, for people who were concerned about their health deteriorating and how that was going to impact on other areas of their life. So, for example, um, whether that would um, impact on uh, remaining in employment. Um, mental health was a very significant theme across the responses. Um, around 15% of respondents told us explicitly that their mental health had been negatively impacted by the crisis. 15 people with existing mental health problems reported to us that they were feeling suicidal at the time that they responded. And hundreds of others told us about the stress and anxiety that they've experienced. And much of that was attributed to worries about health, um, worries about not being able to get access to the things that they needed, people feeling abandoned or forgotten about, um, and also people just uh, feeling very fearful for the future. So the cumulative impact of many of these issues um, that we asked people about, understandably, um, was causing a lot of a lot of stress and uncertainty, um, which resulted in um, serious impacts on on mental health. So overall, our findings told us um, that disabled people, that for disabled people, risk from COVID goes much wider than just a uh, risk to health. Disabled people's right, uh, human rights were put ha, are being put at risk and have even been violated as a result of the responses to the crisis. We also uh, found that the nature and degree of risk um, of experiencing interferences with human rights um, also changes depending on a lot of factors, um, including things like an individual's needs, uh, where someone lives, um, their state, someone's socioeconomic background, their employment status, their household makeup, their age, amongst others. So although exclusion and discrimination and interferences with human rights have long been everyday occurrences for many disabled people, the COVID-19 crisis has aggravated these and created new inequalities and risks, which we think will have consequences far into the future. So if we just go on to the next slide. Um, yeah. So in light of, of, the, of the findings from our survey, and we, we came up with some recommendations or, or what we called core asks, in which we believe are really key at all stages now and, and as we start to build forward to include disabled people as active and equal members of society. And so just very briefly, these are uh, number one, stop stigmatizing disabled people as vulnerable and problematic. Um, two, protect and prom uh, promote um, the human rights of disabled people. Three, involve us uh, as experts in our own lives now and when we build the new normal. Uh, number four, support our local, national and national disabled people's organisations so that we can be involved. And finally, communicate with us and inform us in ways that are accessible to us so that we can be involved. That's me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. So that is um, the end of the first um, portion of of our session today um, lots of lots of uh, things to think about lots of things to discuss in, in the breakout sessions so what we're going to do here is that Linda Fraser has allocated you to breakout sessions um, and those who are chairs know who they are these are some we're gonna we're gonna take about 15 minutes um, starting from about 1030 to about uh, 1045 so what we're gonna do is reflect on um, these two questions um, and give folks an opportunity who didn't present to sort of share some of the findings from their own experience and research in this period. So um, just to share some of some of the key messages that are coming through from your evidence and uh, consider if any of the findings from your organization or your experience resonate with some of the things that the presenters have shared today and if so, how. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen just now.
And what we're going to do is, Linda, if you could um, put folks into the breakout sessions, you will soon be getting an alert and you should be in your breakouts very shortly. And we'll be back here at about um, 1045. And I'll do a quick five minute warning for all the chairs to let them know when it's going to close. So rooms, rooms are opening now. Fantastic. Thank you. Linda, can you put me into, because Kat's here, can you? Hi there, I think we are now all back in the session. So what we're gonna do is um, Jane Marriott was very smart and noted that two hours is a long time to sit on Zoom. Uh, so <laughs> we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Mm, yeah, we'll take a 10 minute break, go get a cup of tea, refresh your drink, um, think very hot, long and hard about uh, policy recommendations <laughs> and wait with bated breath for the next three presentations. So we will see you back here just before, um, just, yep, yeah, just before um, 11. So then share my, start sharing my screen again um, and hopefully all of us will be um, flowing back into the session as, as and when. So let me quickly just um, share my screen again. Thanks for coming back. Um, and um, the first presenter we're going to have in this second set of presentation is Karen McArdle from, um, she's a professor emerita at, from the U University of Aberdeen, um, but she'll be speaking about her work in Fife. So let me quickly share my screen. All right. Can you see that? All right, Karen, and make sure to unmute yourself and we'll get you started. Great, thanks, Sarah. The title of what I'm going to talk about is Some People Struggle Now More Than Ever, which is the title of the report I'm currently writing about some research commissioned by Fife Council that was done in partnership with the community teams in Northeast Fife. Um, it's very much a partnership approach to the research because the community workers did all the interviewing for my research as, and uh, they were very good at engaging with the local people. Can we go to the first slide, please? Um, I need to tell you what I did because it, I use narrative inquiry, which is about storytelling, which is an accessible means of working with people and starts from silence. You're not prejudging what they're going to talk about. You ask them one question. Can you tell me about the first time uh, you heard about COVID-19 and then you prompt them to tell you the story starting from silence. We looked at working with vulnerable and disadvantaged people. So we used people who'd use the food boxes and the community fridge or got crisis grants from um, the council. The sample was a very strong sample. It was, uh, we, we did case studies because narrative inquiry is about case studies in depth of 35 people. It was the population was biased towards women because women were the people using the food boxes in the community fridge. Um, the other thing I need to tell you is that we were looking for the complexity, the interrelationship of disadvantage because poverty can cause many different forms of disadvantage. So we were looking to identify what life was like before COVID-19, what life was like now in lockdown, and what that meant for the future and the new normal for these people. Can we go to the next slide? So the things that we found out were primarily social isolation, which is not surprising in a rural community. 
we had uh, elderly folk living in rural villages or in isolated areas who were absolutely miles away from anything and away from their family, family had moved away. And they had fears of being unable to get to hospital if something happened and were afraid of phoning an ambulance and were unable to get to the supermarket because of the cost of buses and no buses being available. So they had very complex issues. The strongest finding that came out was mental health issues, which other people have talked about. Um, everybody we spoke to, every single one of them, talked about the difficulties they had with mental health. And this was people who had no longer got access to psychiatric help that they'd had before COVID-19, and people who described how they'd lost their mojo as part of lockdown without having these issues before. Food insecurity was a real issue. Um, a, an, a large number of people hadn't eaten on certain days and had found it difficult to get to um, supermarkets because of rural transport issues. And food vouchers were um, a two-edged sword in that they were for the local co-op, but the local co-op may not have the variety or the cost of things that could be bought from a, a somewhere further away more expensive to get to, but they could get what they wanted there. Thinking about the future, there was, we discovered that there was a danger of volunteer fatigue. People were volunteering really well in the communities, but there's the danger of what happens when people go back to work and are no longer interested in volunteering. So who's going to feed these people then? So we identified that there was a complexity of disadvantage. And this complexity manifested itself in, for example, one single parent who was in a refuge with a child who had ADHD and OCD and had debt and alcohol issues. So there was not just one thing. All these people had multiple issues that were coming together in a way that caused their lives to be fairly chaotic. And the other thing I wanted to say about the haves and have not findings is that these people in Northeast Fife are not represented in Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation because there isn't a sufficient population of them. They're isolated, they're individuals, they don't add up to numbers that people can care about. So can we have the next slide? So what needs to be done? Um, the first thing that's important is investment in community spirit so people can take so that communities can take responsibility rural communities can be nurturing friendly and beautiful they can also be cold unfriendly um, judgmental and excluding and hold stigma so we need to invest in community spirit so the communities take responsibility for everybody in their environment Community activism is about empowering people to be self-reliant and be able to take responsibility for themselves and start tackling some of the issues they experience, such as unemployment, poverty, and the link to poverty. And political literacy is really important for these people so they can start making change for themselves. Investment in mental health signposting because of the complexity and chaos of people's lives signposting is really important so people need somebody needs to be able to help people deal with the practical issues of housing neighborhood conflicts things like that but also needs to be able to help them find a community health nurse or psychiatric nurse or psychiatrist so the signposting to help people cope with the chaos and finally the things that I thought, thought were most important are the things that are not often funded and which need to be funded. And that's investment in the small steps of community development, investment in these in the long term, and investment in those who can do community development. Because it's, it's not oft, always as understood as it could be, but getting people to be engaged in community is a really important way of dealing with the issues. So just final, final statement, now more than ever, we need to change the narrative of community. In Northeast Fife, it's seen as a golf and tourism place that's very well off. But there are these people who are whispered about and hidden, and we need to change the narrative now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Next up, we have Nicholas Labigra, 
from the University of Aberdeen. Hi there, thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm a teaching fellow and archivist at the Elphinstone Institute, uh, and I'm an eth ethnologist and folklorist. So really what I do in my everyday research is, is try to understand how people creatively respond to everyday life in, in various ways. And so this Lockdown Lore Collection project really came from that. Um, I should say that uh, this project is still ongoing uh, and it's supplementary to my teaching responsibilities. So it's really something I'm doing on the side. So I've not had time to really get too in depth with a lot of the materials. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the project and some of the things that I have been able to, to pick up. So uh, the Lockdown Lore Collection project is, uh, first of all, documenting a wide range of creative responses to the pandemic. Uh, it's an ongoing crowdsourced volunteer supported long term archival and research project. So the idea is that uh, this material will be useful to people in 20, 50, even 100 years time uh, and it will be publicly accessible. Uh, it's Scotland focused, but it isn't exclusively limited to Scotland uh, and it's divided into five themes roughly. This is, these are themes that I came up with right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and people have submitted things that don't quite fit into categories and that's okay because we all know that categories are abstract and that's absolutely fine. So we've got handcrafted responses to the pandemic, stories of lockdown living that's been done either through written texts or via ethnographic interviews, uh, pandemic related songs and tunes, uh, pandemic related poetry, and finally digital initiatives that have been set up during the pandemic. Uh, so in terms of submissions to the project we've had over uh, 350 submissions by unique individuals uh, and new submissions come in regularly. I had another one this morning uh, as the situation changes and demands new responses. So as soon as uh, Nicholas Sturgeon put Aberdeen on lockdown within I think half an hour, somebody sent me an, uh, a poem in response to that. So there you go. Um, each submission may contain multiple items. So it might be several photos or poems. Uh, so actually the number of items in the collection is now well into the thousands. Uh, most have come from Scotland, but we've received things from Canada, the States, Russia, Nigeria, Japan, India, and, and lots of other places besides. Uh, and volunteer interviewers, mostly my former students, so MLIT PhD students in ethnology and folklore, have conducted ethnographic interviews with over 50 people uh, with still more interview scheduled. So I have about 100 hours of audio recordings uh, and video recordings now with Zoom actually as well, um, of, of people talking about their lives during the pandemic. Uh, and just some photographic examples of some of the sorts of things being submitted. So some of them range from these sort of very positive uh, imagery to the next slide, which is uh, more political in nature. Uh, so political stickers that people have been documenting, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that's been able to gain a lot of momentum uh, in part because of the pandemic, uh, you know, sarcastic responses to Dominic Cummings and Barnard Castle and things like that. That's at Portobello Beach in case anyone is wondering where that's taken. Um, so different things like that. Um, and then I've just, the next slide would be fine, I guess. In terms of vulnerable and or disadvantaged participants, so this wasn't the focus. And I should say that to make the project as accessible as possible, I really tried to make my online form very, very simple. And so uh, I sort of regret it now, but at the time I didn't ask people for really in-depth details about their backgrounds. I'm not a sociologist, so I don't do things statistically in any case. Um, but through these long-term conversations that we've had with people and through some of the poems and, and other things, I've been able to get uh, the following. So we've had uh, patients who have, who have um, who had COVID-19 but are still suffering from long-term effects from it, uh, disabled people, uh, elderly people, and financially and socially disadvantaged people. So all these four groups have submitted things to uh, the project or have been interviewed. In terms of the patients who had COVID-19, uh, some of the things they've been saying is that their symptoms are constantly being questioned. They don't feel like they're being treated seriously by medical practitioners or others. Uh, and they don't feel um, that patients are being listened to or learned from. Uh, so patients are trying to tell their stories via blogs and other things. Uh, and they don't think that that's really um, been take, taken on board, excuse me. In terms of disabled people, someone told me um, that they feel like a, a pariah, that they're scared, that they're, uh, pe people are scared that they as disabled people are more susceptible to catch and spread the virus. 
uh, and there's a constant fear and stress of the DWP reassessing them if they are too active. So people have been trying to be active in the voluntary sector in response to the pandemic to help other people have been afraid to do so because of how they might be reassessed. And then basic things like not being consulted on well-intentioned but dangerous ideas like uh, I know in Aberdeen, for example, they recently widened the pavements. Uh, but this was done without making way markers for blind people. So people were talking about how dangerous this is now for them to walk in the city centre. Um, elderly people were talking about having difficulty accessing and using the internet. So a, lo a lot of this reflects what was told by our, our really wonderful presentations this morning by the third sector folk. Uh, and feeling condescended to by being told to shield when they want, uh, want to contribute actively. In fact, somebody sent me a series of about, I think, 15 poems reflecting on this idea of being uh, told the shield when they felt perfectly fine. Um, and financially and socially disadvantaged people, these are just not an exhaustive list at all, but some things that came up, not having any access to garden space. Um, it's just something as simple as the accommodation that people are staying in um, and a constant exposure to the virus or potential exposure to the virus due to reliance on things like public transport or working in high risk jobs such as carers. Uh, and being targeted by politicians as scapegoats for poor behavior during the lockdown. For example, um, in the first lockdown, I stayed in Leith, I've now moved to Aberdeen, but Leith links, there were pictures of people uh, sitting there uh, and uh, being told that they were not social distancing when actually if you're walking there, you would see that they were, but these were people who didn't have access to green spaces, who were using their only access to green spaces uh, and being targeted. So people have mentioned that to me. Uh, and I think that's it for this slide. So with regard to creating a new normal, perhaps the most important lesson learned from this research is that the pandemic hasn't only re introduced new problems, but exacerbated existing ones. Uh, and we really need to fix these, these problems. I mean, that's the key thing. And I think that's what everybody's talking about. Uh, structural racism, sexism, all the, the classic things that we all know about. Uh, but this was really made clear to me uh, when I moved into my my place in Aberdeen and I looked down the street about five feet from my door there was this wonderful thing fuck life COVID-19 wanted so in a situation where somebody's life is so miserable due to the uh, circum difficult circumstances they they find themselves in that this pandemic is is something to be welcomed that's when there's an issue with society that needs to be addressed and that's and this is just a funny picture that was on Leith Walk that originally said be kind to yourself and someone took off the S and it became be kind to your health. So be kind <laughs> to yourselves and be kind to your health as well. Thank you very much. That's that's really, really interesting stuff and and touches on um, all of the other work that, that we've that we talked about so far. So thanks a bunch for that. And um, the final presentation is going to be from um, my colleague at your Children's Neighborhood Scotland, um, Claire Binner. Hi, hello everyone. Yeah, uh, when Sarah is not uh, organizing and sharing webinars, she's working with me and with Maureen McBride, our colleague, um, in a, a project called Children's Neighbourhood Scotland. Uh, and just to say, we're going to share with you some of findings from our research in Glasgow, but we've also conducted research on in South Lanarkshire and on migrant families, and we're doing a review on vulnerability and resilience. So we've got quite a few projects going on just now. Um, this research uh, is, includes data that Sarah is involved in, in collating for us, and also mixed methods research. So it includes um, 15, uh, the data from 15 in-depth interviews with frontline service providers and strategic service providers in Glasgow. So I'm going to be quite quick and just a lot of the issues that we, we've picked up um, have been covered already today. But one of the things that I think we, we want to emphasize is that that people, children and families who are living in high poverty neighborhoods, they have a higher risk of, of contracting a severe form of the illness of COVID-19, but they're also more vulnerable to the negative social and economic effects of going into lockdown and the resulting economic crisis. So what we're finding is that those pre-existing inequalities that we've already talked about um, really have uh, make people more vulnerable to the, sh the closure and the ceasing of health and social care services. And that's a vulnerability and impact potentially for the long term. 
Um, so we, we also are finding that in addition to these pre-existing inequalities, we have had a rapid increase in the number of people who are now on universal credit across Glasgow. And you can find out more day, uh, information on that from our research when it comes out. But there are the concerns are that these are not just um, issues of, of ex poverty that we already know about. This is, is new families who might have been just about coping uh, in the past, um, and they may not be known to public services, but they are now in poverty and in crisis. Uh, the impacts of all this is that families who are already under uh, pressure financially have been now under this additional pressure of looking after children at home with delays to financial support. Uh, and what we, find, we found in our research is that there's an interlinked nature of these different stresses on families. So we have financial insecurity of furlough and unemployment, but we also have the guilt that many parents have felt about when they've been struggling with homeschooling, the pressures of childcare and the uncertainty about sc future schooling and how that will work out. And with, there are also serious concerns about social isolation and mental health and how to reconnect some families with the services they were engaged in in the past that, that, that they've, not, they've not been receiving during this time. So we're really concerned about the long-term mental health and well-being effects uh, from the lockdown and, and service professionals really emphasise that as a huge issue. In terms of the third sector, um, the, the positivity, energy and commitment to supporting local communities has been quite striking. Uh, food provision was organised within hours of lockdown being announced and not only food provision but people have extended their services to the whole family even if they were only really supposed to be working with, with perhaps a young person or one member of the family. They've been providing practical support and emotional support to families throughout lockdown. And across the public sector and third sector, people, the, the service providers has really demonstrated the compassion and energy they have to help communities in Glasgow who are suffering the worst effects. But in terms of the third sector, it's really been the stability of grant funding that has been the bedrock of the COVID-19 third sector response. Those organizations that were grant funded were better able to adapt their services. Uh, and they were also willing to put aside the tensions they might have with other local organizations and work in collaboration. So there was a real sense of historic, if you like, uh, solidarity there. In terms, uh, can we move on to policy recommendations? We, we would uh, advocate that the government um, extends social security at this time uh, and provides additional resources for digital inclusion because these are massive inequalities that are increasing and we would join JRF and Save the Children in, in advocating for an increase in, in, in universal credit. We would also call for additional investment in community-based well-being. The mental health uh, support services that are available are already overstretched and are over capacity and we need additional resource at a local level. We also feel that there's a concern around food provision by the third sector has become normalized. So we need to look at ways in which there can be greater support for families and children to take agency through empowering self-help projects at a local level. And we're also um, emphasizing the need for stable grant funding for third sector organizations, reducing the bureaucratic burden on them and streamlining these funding processes, which we saw was possible during the pandemic. And we should look at how that could be a way of working in the future. Uh, like others, we are also f um, found that public sector engagement at a local level, working with community organizations is really important, especially for building trust and working relationships for COVID recovery. And we would also call on local government to take clear action and raise awareness of the lifeline that has been provided by the third sector. And to do this by involving the wider third sector in strategic re emergency response and recovery planning as a matter of course. Uh, really, that's a quick whirlwind tour of, of, of our research, but if you're interested, please follow up by um, contacting Children Neighbourhood Scotland. Fantastic. Thank you, Claire and Karen and Nicholas for that. Um, so again, 
that was a lot of information put on the table. So this is your opportunity to go into breakout rooms again. Um, you might be, I think you'll be with different folks this time um, to think about all the presentations um, and, and sort of looking towards the future. So a lot of issues were raised in all of the presentations and now we want to think about, okay, if we're speaking to um, local or national governments, um, particularly as COVID-19 emergency funding has wrapped up, and we're thinking about how to use existing relatively potentially limited funding streams, where should that, where should that um, focus be? And um, what are some of the ways that we can ensure the participants and client voices are heard in the recovery, either in um, our own research, in third sector organizations or in national organizations? So I'm gonna, um, so those are some things to think about. To stop sharing my screen just now and uh, you should be getting a an alert to go to your your new breakout session so here we go we will see you back here linda let's come back at about um 11 40. Um, hello, folks. I think we are all rolling in. We're almost back in business. And as usual, we are running behind time in digital worlds, in, in real life world. That's how it, that's how it goes in, that, in every session I've, I've ever uh, read, which is fine. Um, what are the thing, one of the things I love about breakout rooms is that particularly when you get put randomly into breakout rooms, you just you meet so many interesting people outside of your discipline. So that was really great for me. And I hope you had um, some really useful and, and, and interesting conversations. So what we're just going to do quickly is I'm not going to share my screen so that you can see the person who is talking, but um, I'm going to um, have the, uh, the chairs of the breakout sessions just give uh, maybe one or two line uh, update about sort of what their key discussion points or recommendations um, were that, that, that they were discussed. And that's going to help us to um, put together an, an, an output document from this, um, a summary document to, for a variety of different audiences. So the first um, breakout chair I'm going to go with is Andrew Patterson. Thanks, then. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be... Um, I've written down notes, so I'll capture things and send them to Sarah. Fantastic. In terms of that last discussion, there was a quite a bit on the in building on the point that was made in Claire's presentation about that sustainable or, or um, stable funding, streamlined funding with less red tape that frees up organisations. We were hearing first-hand experiences of organisations that have really benefited from that type of approach um, and struggled with the opposite as well. Um, and a uh, lot of uh, then we were also talking about um, the really a recognition that there's a we, we also we can't jump ahead too much we need to remember that there's going to be a heck of a lot of real social economic um, uh, fallout from all this and people are going to be experiencing real challenges um, so there's going to have to be a lot of thought given to how we um, support people. Um, so that's a priority as well. And uh, the last thing that we just discussed there was, um, well, was participative methods as well. The, how, the, so going back to sort of Karen's presentation, community development approaches, um, local, local democracy as well was mentioned and local governance review will be picking up again. Um, I also chipped in the Citizens Assembly as well, which I've had a good experience of. So these, these are the types of um, approaches of involving people as well, and, and especially listening to um, vulnerable uh, people's voices. 
Thank you. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm furiously typing away. So at the end of this, I'll, I'll, I'll share my, my slide to make sure we, um, we all um, see that. The next person I'm going to go to is my friend Sarah Ward. Unmute myself. Hi. <laughs> okay, so we've got some common themes um, with uh, what was being spoken about there. So on the first question, that was really focused on, we had a big discussion around uh, equipping people with skills at an individual level, particularly around food, um, around cooking, around being self-sufficient, being able to access food ingredients, being able to, to cook and buy healthy ingredients quickly. And we had a big discussion about the importance of thinking about these things now before a second wave of the virus might hit. And these kinds of issues, uh, you know, um, are back in terms of lockdown. So we spoke about food and we spoke about digital and that they were our two kind of main focuses, but it was similar kinds of issues around individual agency and um, being able to uh, cope and access uh, with dig digital um, technology. Um, yeah, we've got lots of detail on that that I'll write up, but because of time, I'll, I'll move on to the, se the second question. Um, sorry, the second area of the first question, which was um, like the previous group around funding. So we spoke about that there needs to be a rethink at a national level about how we do funding how we do grant funding, what's expected of small groups in terms of evaluation, what's actually needed. Um, and then in terms of short, medium and long term planning, there was a feeling that uh, third, particularly third sector organisations have suddenly had to become really good at doing this, but they don't have the funding to back them up, particularly in terms of long term planning. Um, so those were our kind of two main areas in the first question and the second one around voice. Uh, again, some similarities. So we spoke about really important in terms of participatory research, co-design co methods, how we do consultation and participation and co-production is so important. But also a feeling that Scottish Government is a, an advocate for this already. So there is actually something to build on there um, in terms of alternative methodologies and, and actually um, supporting people who are the experts on their own lives, as somebody said in their presentation, mm -hmm. to, to amplify their voices and that this needs to be amplified further at national and local government. Um, so yeah, we spoke about it being people-centred and place-centred, um, that we can use case studies, amplify case studies, more creativity. Uh, we spoke a lot about that it would, wouldn't it be nice if it was easy to participate in research and that you could make a, a short video diary and that that was accessible to people, these kinds of methods that need to be properly resourced to make it easy for people to participate. Um, and that par partnership working is, is essential to that, to kind of support people to be able to use creative tools and methods. I think that's Thank it. You. Thank you. Bye. The next person is Claire Binner. Sorry, right, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, lots of common themes again. Uh, we start, we kicked off by talking about um, the uh, enormous uh, social, economic, and health inequalities that, that are being faced and the need for the extension of social security uh, support, um, worries about the end of furlough and what this means. So, issues around conditionality, the two child limit, waiting times health issues and yeah the 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 call to Westminster to address these issues uh, for social security. We also then discussed the issue of um, policy making for not just the reactive response planning but for long-term recovery and how uh, that needs to be done by listening to people and understanding the context of their lives in depth. Uh, but we also talked about how we recognize that the incredible um, role that the third sector is playing and some of the organizations that have spoken today have demonstrated um, 
the extent to which they are really supporting and enabling that voice uh, to come through, through the research that they're doing. So it's really, we're really kind of encouraged, I think. It, uh, I think one person said, you know, sometimes as academics, we assume that people are not being reached, you know, that they're hard to reach, but actually the, 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 the organizations represented here today have shown that they are really reaching people and bringing those voices. So that's really encouraging. Um, we are uh, recommending that absolutely the third sector, sustainability of funding, particularly around issues like mental health, needs to be addressed and we need to look at streamlining those grant making processes which can be done if there is uh, the will to do it. Um, and we, are, we also discussed uh, the issue of uh, public sector and third sector partnership and concerns that actually in some areas community planning shut down during lockdown and, and what does that tell us about the role of community planning in Scotland if it's not seen as an essential mechanism for public sector and third sector collaboration at a time like this. So um, we really think that, that one of our recommendations is potentially really to review the role of community planning mm -hmm. in, in this, mm -hmm. in this uh, mm -hmm. recovery period. Um, uh, I think that covers anything, everything, uh, our main points, unless anyone from my yeah. group um, if not, you can let Sarah That's know. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Karen, did you lead a group as well? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. A couple minutes on that would be great. Yes, we talked very much about um, the health inequalities and the need to sort out these issues of health inequality mm -hmm. and prevention. Thinking very much of prevention being a holistic Thing, which deals with the complexity of people's lives. So we talked about link workers with GP practices, we talked about signposting, and we talked about social prescribing being important. Um, we also talked about um, some of these prevention projects are very complex and we need to not think in terms of evaluating them from the perspective of numbers. We need to think about them in terms of sometimes getting it right for one person, which takes a long time, is really very worthwhile. And so the evaluation of things with, which are complex doesn't work well with numbers. We then talked about voice and talked about the importance of local democracy and empowering communities to be self-reliant. And we talked about political literacy of which there are examples from the WEA and the People's Health Trust. And we felt that these um, activities can be very important in getting people to speak and put their foot forward their point of view at, at a local and national level. We also felt there was a need for, some people would feel that was a strong thing to do, but other people would feel they wanted to do it not in a group, but in confidence and libraries could participate in helping people to put forward their points of view or local community hubs. Um, in terms of, so in terms of uh, our priorities, the two priorities that we thought were most important were prevention and political literacy. And I'll write you notes about the detail of the conversation. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, and do we have one more with Jane? Was Jane leading a group as well? Yes, Jane, go ahead. Um, is that, is that right? Yeah. Um, we had uh, very similar um, discussions. Um, we started off with um, thinking about um, uh, what the risk might be because there's been um, so much change and so much potential uh, for change and opportunity. Um, and a real commitment, which is helpful, but the scale um, of, that um, you know that is needed, um, we thought that might be difficult. So that you know it might end up um, you know discussions in silos. So we were very much thinking that one out of our recommendations might be for Scottish government to be you know continue speaking internally. There's lots of um, uh, reviews and lots of. Uh, bodies uh, within um, that are, you know, there's lots of initiatives, but there needs to be some sort of oversight. Um, and we thought Scottish Government 
um, should be um, that they were having that are, are in the place where they can have that um, oversight. And we talked a lot about voice and ensuring there's a diversity um, of voice, whether that's for action or for policy, and making sure that um, policymakers hear voices that perhaps they might not want to um, hear. Um, and you know that might be making sure that a diversity of research um, is 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 used and not sort of um, the sort of usual um, uh, voices to be heard within the research sector. Uh, we've talked a little bit about sort of um, hidden hidden voices um, that might be sort of um, carers, but whole families are impacted and all ages. Uh, um, and as well as abilities. We also thought that networks were really important um, so um, you know to ensure that the same things aren't being done in si silos or people aren't repeating and um, doing the same thing so um, that might be there might be a sort of central pot to dip into sharing of data um, um, and um, being transparent um, about that. And we talked also about um, funding that's needed for to make sure that um, there's a structure, an infrastructure for meaningful involvement um, of people and that sh people should be involved in um, the design um, of services as well. And we talked about sharing of, um, of power. Um, and we talked about the importance in investment in community development um, as uh, you've spoken about. So I think that sort of sums up. Super. Um, That's great. A lot of a lot of commonalities there, and I realize we're we're running out of time. And one of the things, one of the probably the key thing that came up in my group um, that that connects with 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 this too is thinking about how to to use creative methods to get the voices of those folks um, that those folks heard. Nicholas's presentation in particular provided a, a real opportunity for us to rethink as academics, as third sector organizations about what the arts and humanities can do to provide a way for, for our clients and, and folks that we serve to, to get their voices out there and thinking about the ways that we can uh, work across disciplines in particular and work across um, sectors to be able to do that effectively. So that, that really came, came through for us. And also bring that evidence to policymakers and put that in, in there with, uh, you know, all the statistical tables that I love to put together all the time is, is, is bring, those, bring those stories together as well because there's no, there's no one right type of evidence. And I think that, that that's something that, that we can be um, stronger about to policymakers as well. So um, to finally to finally finish to f finish up, um, just quickly, it would be remiss of us partnering with someone from Evaluation Support Scotland if I didn't include an evaluation uh, in in this year. I think I think I would be uh, burned at the stake here. So um, what we've done here is that Jane has put into the chat function a quick evaluation of this. We're hoping to do more of these, likely online, of course, um, uh, over the next few months. So um, it will talk about the format, discussion topics, and all of that stuff. So you have, if you have an opportunity to do that, um, that would be really super right now. So I'll keep the chat function up, but um, take take a look out for um, an an output from myself and from Jane. I'll be putting all of this stuff together as we look in into the to the chats and the notes and the breakout sessions um, about, uh, about about what we talked about today and we will make the slides available to to you and also if you have um, if you want to get in touch with any of the presenters today and you didn't catch your email addresses um, you can either send them to send your inquiry to me and I will forward it on to, to that panelist but um, uh, that is all from me so far. Thanks so much for your active engagement today 
And if you want to get in touch with me at any time, you should have my email address. Um, and um, I, I really appreciate your time. So again, I'll, I'll keep that open. I'll keep things open if you want to do the evaluation just now. But um, that's all from me. Thanks a bunch.